So we're going to talk about phenobarbital, which is one of the most common drugs used to treat epilepsy in dogs and cats. I'm going to give you some facts about its effectiveness, the common side effects, and what's the impact long term on your pet's health and how to prevent that, what sort of monitoring we use. So whether or not you're just starting out uh, on the journey of treatment for your pet or whether you want to find out more, I'm hoping that these top five facts will give you that confidence and information to go forward. Five useful things to know before a prescription of phenobarbital is started in a dog or a cat. The first thing is that phenobarbital probably is the most effective anti-epilepsy drug. Yes, uh, there may be people listening to this who immediately want to comment and say, based on that anecdotal evidence of one dog or cat, that this supplement worked or that diet change worked. That's great for you. But for the vast majority of animals with severe epilepsy, and that is to say having a tonic-clonic seizure or grand mal seizure more frequently than every two months, they are going to need some effective drugs. And phenobarbital is likely to be effective in about 80% of those cases. And when we compare that, uh, say, to the other main players that are licensed for monotherapy, uh, bromide and um, imepatoin, which is also called pexion, then we can see that although these uh, can be effective in about 60% of cases as a single agent, they are not as effective as phenobarbital. So if we had to choose one drug, then this is the drug to choose. Zanizamide is uh, a drug which is licensed for human epilepsy, and it is also uh, about as effective as bromide or imepatoin for uh, monotherapy, and it can be better tolerated in some uh, dogs. Uh, uh, and indeed in some cats, uh, but it's not licensed for epilepsy, at least in the UK, and it can be more expensive. And levetiracetam is used as an add-on uh, anti-epilepsy agent for the most part. Uh, there have been no studies that have looked at it for monotherapy, and to be honest, I would uh, never use it for monotherapy in a generalised tonic-clonic seizure, and that is because it is better for focal seizures uh, and from myoclonus. And just for information, this is where uh, CBD oil is. Uh, it's a popular thing for people to talk about. This is it, its effectiveness as an add-on agent, so in addition to other drugs, and at an extremely high dose of, of, of nine milligrams per kilogram twice daily, um, where that BID stands for twice daily, which was impacting the animal's liver. The next useful fact is that phenobarbital is probably the cheapest anti-epilepsy drug. And this does depend which country you're in uh, and your own licensing um, laws. But generally across the world, phenobarbital is the cheapest because it's been around um, for almost the longest. And so when we compare the sort of cost per month, at least in the UK, um, then phenobarbital is significantly less than bromide and pexian, uh, which is imepatoin. However, you do have to take into other considerations when you're uh, considering cost, uh, because there is also the cost of monitoring, which means blood samples, which means trips to the vet, taking the blood sample, analysing the blood sample. And we need to measure the um, blood, or what is often called the serum, which is the liquid part of the blood, concentration of the both phenobarbital and bromide, and it's not necessary to do that in imepatoin, which is pexian. And we also need to uh, monitor the red blood cells, which we and the white blood cells, which we call hematology, and also other parameters of organ function, which is usually called serum biochemistry. Uh, in the states, that's um, uh, often called CBC and biochem. So you have those blood sampling and consultation costs. And so um, if you are a, a veterinarian dealing with a, a caregiver who is uh, monetarily challenged, you know, it's where, it, where they're looking um, to have um, where the cost of the medication is, is a, a really uh, a challenge for them to the dog's welfare, then you may need to look at other options and it may be better for that caregiver to have a pharmacy prescription which they can take to a human pharmacist. But in, in, the, um, in the UK, that human pharmacist would have to provide 
um, a veterinary prescription. So most would then uh, take to an online veterinary pharmacist. So um, the next most useful fact is that phenobarbital probably has more potential adverse effects. And this may come as no surprise to people whose pets are on this drug. Uh, and what are these? Well, the common and very dose dependent ones are sedation or drowsiness. Um, uh, as a result, the animal will have a reduction in activity. They often have a loss of coordination. Uh, owners will describe them as appearing drunken. Um, uh, and, uh, and the official word for that is ataxia. That does get better with time. And so uh, many of these adverse effects are seen um, very dramatically when you first put the, uh, the, the pet on the drug and then they get better with time. They also have uh, increased appetite and weight gain. And because these drugs are broken down or metabolized by the liver, it does mean that you will see an increase in uh, liver enzymes when you take a biochemistry panel, i.e. a blood sample to look at liver. Uh, and that is just the liver enzymes becoming more active to deal with this drug. You can get other uh, um, adverse effects or side effects. These are more unusual. So you don't see them with every case. You don't see them with increased dose. When they happen, it's down to the individual. So we call that idiosyncratic. Um, you can get some behavioural changes, especially anxiety, uh, not as bad as levetiracetam, or so should we say common as levetiracetam, but when it happens, it's a real issue. Uh, you can get some haematological uh, adverse effects, um, pancytopenia, which means loss of all uh, types of blood cells, or uh, low levels of a type of white blood cell called neutrophils, um, and you uh, can sometimes even get or other autoimmune diseases such as systemic lupus erythematosus. You can get a very rare, um, but uh, I have to say I've only seen this once in my 30 year uh, um, career, um, but you can get a syndrome called pseudolymphoma, which is where the lymph nodes get really, really big as if they're cancerous, but they're not cancerous. And of course it is metabolized by the liver and there is the possibility of hepatotoxicity. So let's talk about that, phenobarbital and the liver, because it's something that owners really worry about. And this is the molecular structure of uh, phenobarbital, with the black ones being carbon uh, uh, rings. So uh, essentially, as a general rule, larger compounds with double rings, two of those rings, need to have liver metabolism. So what sort of drugs am I talking about? Um, so uh, drugs with no liver metabolism are, uh, are required, have a single ring, um, for example, gabapentin and pregabalin and levetiracetam. Drugs where you need to have uh, a liver metabolism are phenobarbital, zonisamide, and, um, and CBD oil or cabinoid. Never just put the rings on there for you. You can see that the ones that need liver metabolism have two rings. Is hepatotoxicity inevitable? I've seen some real scaremongering on the internet, which is frankly not helpful to caregivers that are struggling to get around the diagnosis of epilepsy and their beloved pet. It's, it's not helpful to see um, comments on social media saying the dog will eventually get liver failure because that is untrue. Um, uh, there is an increased risk. So what increases the risk? Well, given combinations of drugs that have to have liver metabolism. So phenobarbital, these old drugs, phenotoin and primidone, um, rarely prescribed in the UK anymore, and zonisamide. So if you combine phenobarbital and zonisamide, which is done in refractory epilepsy, then you do uh, increase the risk of liver failure and you need to monitor more. How do you monitor? You need to monitor the serum concentration, which means the blood level in uh, of the drug. And you need to maintain it within a therapeutic serum concentration. And for zonisamide, I use the human. You should avoid dosing phenobarbital more than 12 milligrams per kilogram per day. Now, that's controversial. Some neurologists wouldn't agree with that. I've been treating epilepsy for a very long time now. And the cases that I have seen with liver problems or that get liver problems have had high doses of, of phenobarbital. 
uh, more than this level. So if you're having to increase the phenobarbital progressively to get a stable serum concentration, then you need to think about the impact on the liver. And the way that I think about it, it's like having alcohol. If you have, um, one would hope, a, a small amount of alcohol on a weekly basis, then your liver should not be at risk. But if you're having large amounts of alcohol every day, then you're, you're putting um, your, your liver in trouble. We should monitor the liver. So this may start out at um, uh, uh, six months after starting therapy and then drop to annually. But remember, these drugs induce liver enzymes because they require those liver enzymes to break them down. And so just having an increase in those liver enzymes, ALT and ALP, do not, or ALKFOS, sometimes this one is called, that doesn't mean liver failure. And in fact, relying on measuring those as an indication of liver function is is incorrect and will uh, lead you into problems. So what do you monitor for liver function? Well, I find the most useful is the bile acids, especially if you do a dynamic bile acid test, which means after feeding, and the very most useful is albumin, because I found that in, in my experience, dropping albumin is the first sign. So I will monitor serial blood samples over years, because, of course, we're talking about lifetime therapy in many of these dogs. And if I see that the albumin is progressively dropping, even if it's still within the, the, the normal range, if it's getting very, very low normal, I will start to, to um, uh, perhaps do some other liver tests. The next useful fact is that the most common failure of treatment is actually underdosing. So where people think that phenobarbital hasn't worked, it's usually because it's underdosed. And that's partly because many uh, 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 drug formularies and on the labels will say quite a low starting dose. But the, the, the starting dose that will get you an adequate serum concentration for epilepsy is three milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours, uh, at least for a dog, possibly a little bit less for a cat. Um, but for hard to treat epilepsy in cats, this is the starting dose rate. Now, you can titrate up to this dose to reduce the, the adverse effects. What does titrate mean up mean? Well, it means saying, well, we know that we're probably going to have to have three milligrams per kilogram, but let's start at a lower dose and increase over two weeks. But please, vets who are taking blood samples for serum concentrations, don't take a serum concentration at one milligram per kilogram every 12 hours and then another one at two milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours because you're just increasing the costs for that caregiver. Um, and, uh, you know, believe me, it will not be in the therapeutic range unless you have a decent starting uh, constant, uh, uh, dose of three milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours. You should be aiming for this serum concentration. Now, this is a tighter um, range than is given on some labs. So this is some labs have a much wider range going well below um, 120 or 25 or 123. Um, again, if you if you aren't kind of hitting this figure, then it's unlikely that the seizures will be controlled. Or to put it in conversely, if if you haven't achieved that serum concentration and the dogs see or the cat seizures are not control, then that serum concentration is is too low. It's not ex um, enough just to hit the therapeutic range. And likewise, I never go above um, this level um, because I uh, have um, seen by experience that this is more likely to stress the uh, liver. How do you change the dose? Well, if you look at your um, serum concentration, so suppose I want 25 and I've currently got 17, then I'll divide uh, 25 by 17 and then times that by the old dose and that will give me my new dose. And I can tell you that really that formula works really well. So what monitoring is necessary for phenobarbital? Well, you will have to have regular veterinary checkups. Uh, your vet needs to check that your pet is healthy and not suffering um, from adverse side effects before they write a re-prescription for the drug. Um, you should keep a seizure diary. This can be fairly simple, you know, an Excel chart or just a calendar, or you can um, use a more sophisticated app. You will need to have at least annual blood tests to monitor the uh, the 
blood cells, that's called hematology uh, in America, CBC, and also kidney and liver function, just to make sure those drugs are being eliminated. And uh, you should also have the serum concentration, that is the amount of drug in the blood uh, routinely and regularly me measured, how frequently depends on how uh, well your pet's epilepsy is controlled. And then you use that figure to adjust the dosage, as I've said um, before. So the final fact for phenobarbital is that actually it's occasionally used for treating other non-seizure neurological diseases. Uh, and I include that because that may be the reason why you've come onto this YouTube channel today. And that is because uh, phenobarbital works by stabilising abnormal uh, nerve function. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of that. The, um, the, the first is phenobarbital responsive hypersalivation or silandenosis. Um, this is a condition where the, the, uh, the dog, I've never seen it in a cat, is profusely salivating. And I mean that uh, the saliva is it is quite literally dripping from their mouth all the time. So not just a little bit of drool, it's a whole lot of drool. And because they're producing so much saliva, they are trying to swallow it um, and they may vomit or retch up um, the, that saliva, often are gulping because they're trying to swallow it. And the dog often looks very nauseous uh, and distressed and they lip smack and, uh, and may gag or not want to eat. Along with that, it seems that their salivary glands are enlarged, particularly the submandibular salivary gland. Um, and those are the ones that you can feel are under the jaw. Um, and, and importantly, they're, they're, uh, both sides are large and it's non-painful, whereas if there is uh, infection, then they will be painful or you know, some other uh, nasty lump would be uh, painful. You do need to re re rule out other causes of drooling a lot. And the most important of that is an inability to swallow due to neuromuscular diseases such as myasthenia gravis or polymyositis, or because there's quite literally something stuck in their throat, an esophageal foreign body. The other situation that phenobarbital can be used in is the feline neuropathic pain syndromes, most classically is feline orofacial pain syndrome or FOPS. Um, this syndrome is similar to trigeminal neuralgia in humans. They have episodes of severe oral discomfort and they can uh, traumatize their face and their mouth, in particular their tongue. There's inherited predisposition in Burmese cats and this disease is triggered by oral discomfort, for example, teething or dental disease. And it should be said that dental disease is painful. This is more than that, where the cats are actually mutilating. They can also be triggered by strong smells and stress. And the biggest cause of stress to a cat is, of course, other cats. The other feline neuropathic pain syndrome is feline hyperesthesia syndrome. And these uh, are characterized by episodes suggesting extreme sensitivity along the cat's back. Um, there are many other causes of a cat twitching or rolling um, uh, it, the skin on the back. And it's very important to rule out skin disease, even as a contributory uh, cause. And you also need to rule out environmental influences, um, such as uh, this is very much more common in indoor cats. And, uh, and again, other cats are the biggest source of stress to cats. Um, in this big umbrella, um, uh, which probably includes uh, some cats that don't actually have that syndrome, there is a much more serious um, syndrome of tail mutilation. And it's, it's really these cats that are going to be, have to be on drugs which suppress uh, those hyperactive nerves such as phenobarbital, although we often use other drugs such as pregabalin and fluoxetine in the first instance. So, in conclusion, phenobarbital plays an important part in epilepsy management in dogs and cats because it's effective and it is less expensive than other alternatives. Um, I should say it also is, it is used over some human drugs because it it only has to be do dosed twice daily or even in some cats once daily. However, the downside to this is that minor adverse effects are common and monitoring is essential for the more serious adverse effects. And to be effective, it has to be dosed correctly. It has to achieve a stable serum concentration. And phenobarbital is sometimes used for non-seizure neurological um, disorders because of its property of reducing 
abnormal nerve activity. Thank you very much.